Well, here we are on another Wednesday. I'm still Pruitt, that's still Jim Davis, and this is still Dungeons and Dragons. And you may have been asking, where's the dungeon talk? Well, guess what? This is that dungeon talk, and it's all for you on WebDM. Let's delve into some dungeons. Let's Jim delve Davis. into some dungeons. So we had a, a, a trio of shows recently, uh, Traps, Mimics, and uh, Oozes. Yeah. Trio of shows where we kind of mentioned sort of dungeon, we, we touch on the dungeon as a, as a place to adventure in. Right, and, the, and the, the monsters and things that would inhabit it to enrich it. Right, But right. let's talk about the whole dungeon. Let's talk about all of it. All of it. The Everything, whole dungeon, just like the whole enchilada. Let's, yeah. Whole so dungeon. where where do dungeons get fun? If you're not if you're not working with a safe word, to me the the, the dungeon is a um, there's a reason it's in the title of the game, right? <laughs> there it's Dungeons and Dragons, and so I think over the years dungeons have gone have varied in terms of popularity, how 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 players approach the dungeon. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there's a lot of different ways that it's been handled over the additions of yeah. the game. The importance of the dungeon to the game as a whole. To the whole to, as a whole is certainly diminished, but at the same time, 5th edition is a perfectly good, uh, you know, you run a perfectly good dungeon crawl there. What I like the most about a dungeon is that it's, if you think about the way adventures and, and uh, individual sessions are encountered and you visualize what a dungeon looks like, then a dungeon is just a flow chart for play. Right. Here's a room, something's going to happen in it, maybe, maybe not. There are different connectors that will connect you to other scenes slash rooms. And it, it, like any good, uh, say, city investigation where you're investigating a murder, you start out with the murder scene. That's like your first one in the dungeon. And then there's different leads you can follow, different right. corridors that lead different places. And so like the dungeon is like a physical representation of what role playing is in almost any situation. So when you kind of wrap your head around the fact that it doesn't matter that it takes place in a subterranean environment with rooms and corridors and whatever. It's laid out just like you would a city investigation, an intergalactic bounty hunting mission. They're all basically scenes and connectors. Right. When I think about it like that, the dungeon then is this environment that has limit, you know, there's limits to it. Yeah. There's, uh, there are clear boundaries where the players are like, hey, this is where the adventure is. Mm -hmm. You can venture outside of it, but maybe the DM's not prepared or maybe you're not going to get anything. Yeah. If you want something to do tonight, here is what we have to play. Um, and so it's this play environment mm -hmm. that uh, rewards in exploration, it rewards creativity, it has clear boundaries, there are clear avenues of inquiry, there are places that you can go. If you're creative enough, you can go outside those bounds of it, and if the dungeon is well made, there are plenty of different ways to get around. Right. And so that's why I love dungeons. Yeah. Full stop. Full stop. Yeah. So let's talk about a few different a few different types of dungeon that you possibly could do. Right. So what, what are some of your favorites? So I mean, some of my favorites have got to be just the classic funhouse dungeon. Yeah, just uh, random, just random, fuckery. random stuff. There's no continuity necessarily between room to room. Yeah. There's no overall theme. Sometimes they're set up by a wizard. Other times they're maybe like an intergalactic or interdimensional prison or space or something that collects creatures that sort of sit there. White Plume Mountain would be a good example of just a fun house dungeon where it's like, oh, there's a vampire in this room and a purple worm in this room and there's really no rhyme or reason towards it. Right. There's not, not any connect not a lot of connecting clues or things from this level to the next. Right. It's just be prepared for whatever. Just be prepared. And so to me the pitfall of funhouse dungeons is that there is ones that aren't gonzo enough. Yeah. Right, ones that try to, to keep a lid on, on the, the weirdness that goes on around them, where the Funhouse Dungeon really works when it's like, yeah, this is bizarre. There is no lid. There is no lid. And, and you know, our, uh, our friend Audie ran one where it was like a cat with a deck of many things that she's playing, and then the next room is like some weird illusion room, and like every room about the dungeon felt like it was its own puzzle. Yeah. And its own, that you had to figure out. There's other types of dungeons. There's the ancient tomb. Yeah. Sort of like Tomb of Horrors would be one of those. Uh, that's specifically a death house dungeon designed to maim, incapacitate, and murder as many PCs as possible before getting there. Yeah. But there could just be an empty tomb. Right. Or maybe one invested with undead. The monster lair is another one. A goblin warren, an orc stronghold. Uh, and then there's other weirder ones. The living organism. A creature oh, yeah. so big 
that you can enter into it and adventure inside of it. Yeah. Um, I ran one of those for you guys once. You guys fought the Leviathan. Oh my God. Uh, a serpent so big that you, that, you know, it was like at the bottom of this pit and there were a bunch of people singing to keep it asleep so that it didn't wake up and destroy the world. You guys had to go in and one group of you ended up near the brain yeah, we, we, fighting I mean, we, there were like four of us, and we yeah. had a couple people with us. Right, right, so right. So we split the party because we were like, it was two two parties at two that parties point. Two parties at that point. And yeah. one went for the brain, and one went for the heart because we assumed that you needed to kill both at the same time That's right. to yes. take down a creature of this size right. before it could rip its way out and like actually do damage to the sunken, like the sunken city yes. that was around that was the around mouth it. of this like Sarlacc pit basically, with basically. this open mall that we climbed down into. Yes, that's right. Oh my God. And so yeah, one group fighting the brain and the electrical, imp having to dodge electrical impulses and the brain parasites that were there. And then the others of you who are fighting your way to the heart and the yeah. and worms. It, and, and it had antibodies uh, fighting us. And also it had heartworms, it had heartworms. that like yes. came out and attacked <laughs> Us. And I mean, hey, it, that was one of the more memorable dungeon delves. Right. It brings to mind like movies like Inner Space. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, I assume this is going to be aired late enough where we're not really going to spoil or spoil anything. Right. With, Spoilers uh, for the new Guardians of the Galaxy. Guardians? There are some scenes that remind the living organism. Uh, oh man. Would, that would re recall. Uh, oh yeah. my God. It's so beautiful. It's it's, it's so yeah. beautiful. It's very beautiful. We saw. If you haven't it. seen Guardians of the Galaxy by now, then shame on you. Real shame. Um, Someone should walk behind you with a bell. Yeah. Crying shame. Shame. Um, so so sir, here are some others. Ruins are one. Just generic ruins. Yeah, generic uh, ruins of a, you know. Which sort of leads into a ruined or abandoned or lost city. Yeah. Can be used as a dungeon. Obviously, the sewers beneath a, a thriving met metropolis mm -hmm. make for a good uh, dungeon encounter. The Wizard's Tower is another classic one. Usually, yeah. it's sort of a vertical dungeon with... Is that not you know, just an inverted dungeon, basically? Basically, yeah. And uh, so, I mean, these are just sort of like the physical form of what a dungeon can take and sort of maybe, you know, give you some inspiration for it. Um, but even the exterior around a dungeon can have uh, an impact on it. You know, a dungeon set in a swamp is going to have different characteristics than one set in the Arctic or underwater or in the desert or in a forest. Yeah, like a sunken city. A sunken city. Like Atlant you find Atlantis that fell into the ocean. A crashed spaceship uh, is another one that uh, I sometimes like to use, particularly if you're... Like a, like a crash see, beholder tyrant. Hear the the gears. Oh turning. my god! Why didn't I do that? Actually, I did do that. Y'all never went there. Though. Never went there. Um, that was so in yeah. the ocean on Neros Four. Nice. Um, so that's that's <laughs> one where you know if you want to introduce some science fantasy into your game, having a crashed spaceship that's been there for no telling how many yeah. centuries or millennia. And that's just, where the beholders on this world or the elithids came from. That's where they came from. Is uh, this one crashed ship? That's where they're at, and then you can go investigate it and figure it out. So I, I think that sort of the point here is that there is almost no limit. Yeah. A dungeon doesn't have to be a subterranean environment where there's square rooms, 30 by 30, with 10-foot hallways. You know, that's kind of the baseline beginning, but you can have vertical dungeons that yeah. take place in sort of an inverted pyramid that, that you're having to use rope lines to repel through different levels of, you know, of the dungeon as it sort of like extends down into a bottomless shaft or something. And just some, some pop culture like movie references to, to give rise to that idea. I mean, isn't Die Hard just a dungeon crawl? I mean, there's, I'm thinking there's, there's three that, based off of Die Hard. Die Hard's a dungeon crawl, the yeah. raid. The raid uh, and judge and dr dread, not judge dread. No, no, uh, but just dread. Dread. Um, those are three <laughs> I can think of. They're self-contained environments. Yep. Uh, there is a obviously compelling time crunch or time pressure on the yep. protagonists in those. Uh, but they also show you what an active enemy coming after a party uh, looks like. Up looks like. So yeah, I would multiple I would routes, those. multiple routes from, from floor places. to floor. Yep. Having to deal with that. I mean, yeah. it's just like, hey, watch that. If you're going to do a big dungeon delve, make sure you watch those movies. Even the end of 13th Warrior, where they go after the, the, the mother. Warrior, yeah, uh, The Minds of Moria is obviously uh, a really big one in Fellowship of the Ring, uh, as well as the trip through Goblin Town. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Hobbit. The, the Hobbit. Um, and so I think that, I mean, those are obviously the kind of like classic ones for a fantasy genre, but even ones like movies like Die Hard or The Raid. Uh, or dread can show you like how you can use these kinds of environments in 
other settings than medieval fantasy. Right. And so I, I just like it. They, the self-contained uh, element to them, the fact that they are, uh, that they present clear uh, options to the players, but also reward investigation, mean that I think the dungeon is a great thing for new DMs to kind of start out with. Right. Um, if you are a new DM and kind of struggling, coming up with a dungeon for your characters to explore gives them something to do and lets you put in um, you know, clues to a, towards a bigger world or clues that will lead them somewhere else while also giving you a structure for your uh, early games. Exactly. So, like you said, our, our, new, our new DMs, yeah. they found their structure, they found what they want to do, but now they need to populate it with an ecology. Yes. Resources. So yeah. So you, your your first kind of you've you've got an idea for a dungeon. Let's say it's a monster lair in this case, and yeah. it's like natural caverns that they've taken over. Maybe some of them include work uh, work structures or an excavation there. And you're thinking to yourself, like, how realistic does this underground environment need to be? So if you're on the sort of like the naturalist side of dungeon philosophy then there needs to be sources of food and water, a place for the waste to go. If there are living quarters, are they sufficiently big enough and spacious enough for everyone that's in that? Let's say we're dealing with a goblin tribe that's living underground, and you're trying to design this uh, dungeon for them. Do you include a space for the goblin nursery and where non-combatants are gonna be? Are there storerooms for food and other supplies? These are important questions to ask because not, they not only determine the size of your dungeon, but they also determine uh, what the players are going to have to encounter. If you include a nursery, goblin babies, your players are gonna have to make the choice of what they do with these goblin babies, which means you are going to have to figure out, are there any moral implications for what the players might do if they come across these goblin babies? And that's just something you wanna think about as a DM. Now there's the opposite side of this approach, which says a dungeon should be, don't worry about all that. Don't worry about the water, don't worry about the food, don't worry about where they live. The dungeon is there for play purposes only and really should only be inhabited by monsters that are meant to be overcome, right. monsters that are meant to be defeated, um, and don't worry about how they live. Don't worry about making it realistic. That's a fool's errand. I don't know. That, I, I, well, I mean, where do, you, where do you reside on that spectrum? I, I think that, uh, there sh that the dungeon environment should be plausible. Mm -hmm. If the dungeon environment is meant to represent a, a home for a creature, then it should be plausible that this place is a home. But I don't think it should be ex obsessively researched to the point where you got some kind of naturalistic dungeons in like say first or second edition where they just sort of felt like they weren't, they, it was more like describing any, uh, you know, an ecology or an environment or something and not a place that was meant to be played in. So I wouldn't go overboard with it. I might be like, well, they get fresh water from this cistern or this well, or it leaks through the walls here and they've created a pool. Here's where they kind of keep some food. But I wouldn't like make sure that the square footage of it is, yeah. you know, right. You know, there's a, there's a crack over in the corner of this room where they just, that's where they take a crap. That's, that's the crap, where they it's go. the crap crack. It's the crap crack. Yeah. Um, maybe, there's a, maybe there's a gelatinous cube <laughs> at the bottom and that's why it stays there because they crap in that one hole. That's where they go. Back to that gelatinous cube. Um, and so I, th I think, you know, the other hand is like, if this is a place where the goblins live, if it's the, if the goblins are the only ones there, then are there factions within the goblins that the players can then interact with? Yeah. Um, if the goblins are in one part of this cave and then the other part of the cave are the kobolds and there's a war between the two of them or the other part is like a bunch of undead that the goblins don't want to do with, then you've introduced factions yeah. into your dungeon and you've added the possibility for social encounters in your dungeon exploration and combat game, which I am all in favor of. Yeah. Um, including factions in your dungeon is very important because it breaks up the monotony of there's another door, let's kick it down and fight with the people. Check for traps, check check for listen traps. at the drawer, is there any traps? Yes, I disarm them, open it up, yeah. there's nothing, we do a perception check, let's go to the okay, next let's door. So the next one ran yeah. the counter. So if there's creatures there in the dungeon that are meant to be talked to. Yeah, and not just, not, now not we're talking not murder them. hobos, just. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and so the more factions you have, the more opportunities for alliances, rivalries, mm -hmm. uh, uh, goals, working across purposes to each other. Uh, you know, if you're dealing with like a single level of a dungeon, I would say between two to three factions in a yeah. dungeon with space in between those factions that there's some sort of buffer room. I, th I think the naturalist approach to dungeon uh, making is interesting, uh, mm -hmm. but I do think it becomes obsessive at a certain point.
different. Yeah. Uh, obviously, if you're running a funhouse dungeon, you just don't even worry about the ecology of it. You just if you want a creature in this room, how did that dragon get in that tiny room? Who cares? Who the fuck cares? Right. Right. You know, um, then that's the approach that you take to it. Going back to your point of um, of introducing factions and having them interact, another good reference for that is the movie. You can either go with the original Samurai Ujimbo, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or you can go Western with Fistful of Dollars. Right. Because all that is, is an adventurer wandering in a town. <laughs> wandering in a town. There's two factions at war. Right. And what does he do? He goes and he plays this one. And plays then he plays one. this one. one. And then he mm -hmm. plays them across from each other. I mean, like, it's, that, it's, that's just like, that's how you do that, by the way. That's how you do it. And I think that, that, you know, the reason we bring up media so often is because they're good touchstones for a DM. And yeah. a DM should have just a a mental or a, possibly a physical catalog of just ideas and things that they can draw upon. Yeah, as it relates to the dungeon, I usually keep my descriptions of dungeons very short, try to keep it to one line, uh, not a bunch of text to read, I certainly, certainly wouldn't read it just to players. I, I, I want something that's going to spark my imagination enough yeah. that I feel confident running it with a minimum of prep. Um, and dungeons sort of offer the optimal uh, approach to that. You, you said you like to keep it concise. Yeah. But like, what are the important pieces of information to get in there? So you want to include, uh, I mean, it, for, for some of them, they have game mechanic in, uh, uh, implications. So uh, the light, light level. If there are torches, uh, you know, who maintains these torches? What happens when they burn out? Um, if it's not a torch, uh, then it's some kind of magical lighting. I guess you can kind of get away with it. But so what are the light levels in there? Uh, is there anything about the floor or the environment that would make sneaking or being quiet difficult? Anything about the floor or the environment that would make movement difficult in general? So is there a broken floor, sloped passages, slippery passages, things like that uh, that you want to take note of? General features of the dungeon, and most D&D modules will do this, will be like all doors have a lock DC of X, a break DC of Y, you know, X amount of thickness, the walls are made of this. I want general architectural features. Um, and try to include as many senses as possible. What does the air smell like? What is the, is there a feel to the air? Is it humid? Is it cool? Um, what are the random noises that you hear as you're walking through these echoing halls? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a taste in the air or something that you can get? So try to include as many senses as you can. What, is, what does it feel like to yeah. be in the dungeon? While at the same time keeping the descriptions at a minimum that right. you don't, nobody wants to just be read to. Um, or at least in my experience, uh, reading someone can kill the mood. And then I would just make sure that the layout of the dungeon is such that the players are encouraged to explore and rewarded for exploring. Right. So that means that there are, while it's important to have bottlenecks and chokeholds and, and places like that in the, in the dungeon, places that the players can create a barricade or the monsters can create a barricade, you don't want too many of those. And for the most part, you want loops and alternate routes Right. and different ways to get places. And I know I've mentioned before in some of the other the trio of shows that we, we spoke about earlier in the, in the show about if you can lay your dungeon out in a straight line, how many loops does it have versus uh, just dead ends. Right. And so I think that it's important to have a dungeon that, um, that getting to point A to point B can be accomplished in at least two different directions. And one of those ways might be behind a secret door. Right. Right, and that's why you're rewarding players for investigating the room. If you're designing your dungeon and you've got your, right now you're sticking with just a single level, um, consider both, consider the big hubs. Uh, this is where the goblins are. It's a series of five to six rooms. Uh, here's where their guards are. Here's where their treasure is. This is where they sleep. Here are the different ways that it connects to the other part of the dungeon. Here's a bunch of empty space, which is very important in a dungeon. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, wandering monster tables are another. Wandering monster tables for both uh, creatures that are already found in there that have lairs or homes or something, but also wandering monsters that might have come in from outside, including rival adventuring parties, yeah. wizards who are going after a particular rare ingredient that can only be found there. Right. Um, or if, you're, if this is part of a, a multi-level dungeon, creatures from the lower levels that have made their way up here. Mm -hmm. They hear um, some commotion coming from above. Hear some commotion coming from, from above, yeah. So wandering monster tables in that respect are a good way to establish the mood uh, yeah, yeah. and tone. Uh, you want a wandering monster to show up roughly on, uh, if you're rolling once for once every, uh, let's say, 10 minutes that you're in the dungeon, yeah. that you're keeping track of it, you want them to show up on, say, like a one in six chance. So you want there to be enough of a threat of a wandering monster or a wandering encounter is really what we're saying. It doesn't have to be a fight. Right. Um, you want it to be often enough that it happens 
uh, but not so much that every 10 minutes they're dealing with something new and the dungeon is just like, man, it's really crowded in here. You know, you only have so many resources, right? Right. So uh, how, long you, how long you stay there, uh, that might, you know, affect that. It's definitely going to affect it, yeah. Because, um, I mean, you know, the Clash of 1982 asked the most important question about dungeons. Should I stay or should I go? I didn't know that was a question they were asking about dungeons, but I'm glad that they asked it about well, dungeons. That's the beauty of life, man. So the, the question a DM needs to answer is, you know, is this dungeon meant for a quick delve, in and out and one, in one session? Yeah. Full clear. Or is this a multi-session crawl, and if it's multi-session, are you going to allow resting in the dungeon? Right. And what happens to the characters in between that session? Is everyone going to be there? Because in, in some respects, ending your session in the middle of a dungeon is no different than ending your session in most times yeah. you, know, that, uh, that, you know, that you would end it. And if one person can't show up the next week, you just kind of, they, they're standing in the corner. Just yeah. sitting there until you remember that they have something very important that you need, and then all of a sudden they spring into action. Yeah, hopefully it's the thief or the cleric. Hopefully. Because it's just like, well, they check traps, they or check they just traps. heal people and stay in the back, and <laughs> then They don't really need to do anything else. Yeah. So those are two important questions that a DM needs to ask. If you're running a quick delve in and out in one session, then you might want to limit it to five to six rooms. You figure each room could take anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes to explore and interact with, more if there's going to be a combat encounter there. Uh, so ideas for a quick delve would be like a tomb, or if you're running like a, a ruined city that each sort of neighborhood and ward in the city has multiple ways to get down into cellars and sewers and places like that, then the quick delve might be like one house or a small block of houses. But for the multi-session crawl, where it's gonna take a while, maybe, maybe your dungeon has like three levels and there's you know, 10 to 15 rooms a level, um, you know, will you allow resting in your dungeon? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I'm of the opinion that um, n no. Uh, <laughs> that, and, and, you know, the, that, that resting in the dungeon should be dangerous. That these are, particularly if it's like a monster lair, someone lives here. Um, and, and they could run across you, then it's like, where are you gonna hold up? Where are you gonna spend uh, an, an hour to eight hours um, peacefully uh, without being interrupted? And so you might wanna think of other ways. If, if you're thinking like, okay, this dungeon, there's no way to rest in it, but maybe there's a shrine somewhere in there that if you pray at it or a, you know a short rest counts as a long rest there oh yeah or something like that that gives the players uh the ability to sort of refresh their uh their abilities and their spell slots um but reinforces the fact that this place is dangerous you don't want to spend a lot of time down here like maybe it works like once a week at this shrine yeah you yeah one hour counts as eight yeah um, so those are some ideas for it, uh, for, you know, a, a multi-session dungeon. Um, it, you know, I, I think that th the big one is, is, like, just try to make sure that everybody's going to be there week to week. Because if it is a dungeon crawl and you are relying on, say, that thief isn't just a perception check and, uh, you know, a, a thief's tools proficiency. Maybe it's the way that player plays the thief and how they approach the thief class. Yeah. Um, so I would try to get commitments from everybody at the table. Hey, everybody going to be here next week? If not, what are we going to do? Yeah. Um, there are some DMs who run multi-session dungeons where it's like, no, you've got to be out by the dungeon. You've got to be out of the dungeon right. by the end. Even if you're just camping at the entrance or at a yeah. safe spot, you can't stay in the dungeon. And we'll talk in the, in the second part of this episode about how to make the dungeon a, a truly mythic underworld. Mm -hmm. um, which is a, uh, a, something that separates a regular dungeon, just a, an underground location from the mega dungeon, yeah. uh, you know, uh, environment. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's not just a dungeon for Godzilla. It's not just a dungeon for Godzilla. It's mm -hmm. only the greatest experience in D&D ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Babies. Ork babies. They're like Muppet babies. The best taste on earth. Ork babies. Ork, Ork babies. babies. <laughs> see, now I'm just imagining an Ork mom walking in and you only see her from the knees down. Uh -huh. It's a bunch of Ork and Goblin babies. 
Were Muppets take Manhattan the first time they had Muppet Babies? That's the only time they actually did the actual Muppets of Muppet Babies. It was just a cartoon. Anyway. People don't like the Muppet Babies. I like them. What? I watched the shit out what? of that show. I'm sorry. I loved it. What? You know, people say nasty things about Muppet Babies. I loved the Muppet Babies. Who says this about Muppet Babies? Uh, people who hate babies. People. Well, the mind reels that people don't like 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 people that were, grew up with the show or people who watch it now and like oh, that's stupid because I, I can imagine I think people see it as the final sellout of the Muppets I think even people in that time saw it as like it's just a quick cash in on the final like ooh yuck cash in of the Muppets and their and these people don't realize that that that, they, that these creators have to live in America right. Yeah, where, where cashing out and selling out is just the only way you can make money. Like I, I'm sorry. I, I, feel, I feel like I've come 180 degrees on how I used to feel about selling out. It was just like sell out all day long. I'd sell in a heartbeat. Well, I mean, here's I the thing. I can't wait to sell out. Are, are you just selling? Are you just having a property that is yours, and you're just making as much money on it? Or are you actually like selling out a person? I mean, are, if you're not, I mean, if it's just what making are you more. Here? Yeah, well, who's getting exploited? <laughs> if you don't like something, then don't watch it. The Muppets. The Muppets. That's great. I don't know. Perhaps this is because I'm as a as a child of uh, you know grew up with all the action figure extravaganzas that were eight, 80s cartoons. What? Well, that's all and they just were. Like toy commercials. Yeah, it's just like I expect that kind of thing. Of course, the Muppet Babies were selling out. They were probably trying to sell us a whole bunch of crap. It's Miss Piggy, but as a baby. Good grief! Did you get it? Do you? <laughs> 